Good morning. Good morning. Wow, amazing. Amazing, amazing. What a morning this morning. Sure. Um, you know, I don't know. Then it's extremely cold. Then it is just, it's okay to get up. And, uh, but yeah, we've been blessed with some beautiful days this week. And uh, really, really blessed to experience that. So yeah, good morning. Welcome back to another show. Really excited for this morning. Uh, today, the featured topic is unlocking your practice or your businesses through value. And uh, I want to share some thoughts and some insights with you. And uh, I'm really excited about this topic. Uh, hopefully, there's going to be a lot of practical ideas. Uh, there's also a book recommendation right at the end. So definitely something that you want to stick around for. All right, then, uh, obviously, today, uh, there's a few uh, regulars back on the show. I'm really excited this morning to have uh, Lalani Besaidenout herself back this morning doing the news on behalf of the FBI. Uh, and uh, that is the first segment that we're going to go to. So without any further ado, um, for those of you that have said good morning already, let me just say a quick good morning. Ben Kleinans, goeiemorgen. Kobus Klein, goeiemorgen. Kobus, it feels like we haven't like seen and spoken in, in a long time, actually. Um, Arun, good morning. Nice to see you as well. I had a good chat with you last week. Uh, Terence, good morning. Nice to see you here this morning. Uh, uh, been missing you, but but yeah, um, you say that you're watching the recordings and all of that. It's really, really awesome. Mark Bullock, wow, it's been a while. Good morning. Uh, Ronnie Els, good morning. Nice to meet you. Paul Abero, very nice to have you here with us as well. Uh, welcome. Mr. David Kopp, taking a break, but not taking a break, <laughs> I would say. Uh, and Casper Satoli, good morning. Uh, and if you're over on LinkedIn, good morning. Please say hi. And uh, with that, let's go to Lilani in the news studio. Good morning, Francois. It's wonderful to be back on this beautiful Friday morning. Um, I see somebody in Cape Town said it's six degrees. Cape Town, I'm very sorry about that. We are seven degrees in Centurion at the moment. Or if you're Afrikaans, it's Centurion. Um, but yeah, that's a bit strange. But good morning, everybody. I've got one or two stories for you to share. Um, it's mostly around the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. Now, something very interesting that came out, at, I think it was on Monday, the 5th of July, where the FECA said it has come to the attention of the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, in other words, the FSCA, that as a result of the lockdown regulations imposed due to the COVID pandemic, there are financial services providers who use electronic signatures of clients when rendering financial services with or without their consent. So when I started reading this, I thought, oh, you know, it looks like the FECA is not happy with electronic signatures being used because they start with with or without their consent. But then it goes out, just a reference for those who want to uh, read the full communication, it's the FSCA Communication 12 of 2021, and you will find it on their website. But what they're then saying, the purpose of the communication is to provide guidance to the financial services providers and their representatives uh, regarding the use of electronic signatures in the course of rendering financial services. Now, of course, the definition of financial services in the FACE Act is financial advice and or intermediary services where you we normally forget about that intermediary services now because we're so focused on advice but this is with regards to the rendering of intermediary services so if anybody is taking a withdrawal or an advance or an early retirement or a claim so any of those intermediary services that's render it uh, rendering and then the FECA's views on this practice so what they then do is they go on and they quote sections 12 and 13 of the Electronic Communications Act and Transactions Act number 25 of tw uh, 2002. And they quote a few sections there with regards to the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. But then I'm going to jump straight through to the end where they say there's two situations uh, or scenarios that they've looked at, uh, where the client is the originator of the signature and then where the FSP, the financial services provider, uses the electronic signature on behalf of the client. 
So what they are saying, if you look, if you read at the conclusion at the end of this document, I wish I had more time, but I'll, I'll just get you the conclusion of the document. The FSA is saying, you know what, the financial services conduct is not opposed. And this is where we'd like to, you know, hopefully the FSA is not saying, you know, in the midst of level four, jump in your car and go to your client, wear your mask, uh, sanitize, you know, and uh, no, that's not what they're saying. They are saying the FSA is not opposed to the use of electronic signatures by clients to conclude and uh, and agree um, any products or anything with a product supplier. But where the problem comes in, and, and I sort of have to agree with them, they are concerned that the use of electronic signatures of the clients by financial services providers has the potential to expose clients to the risk of fraud, forgery or theft of client assets that would arise from the possible unauthorized, and this is the key word, unauthorized transactions entered into on their behalf. So what the FECA is saying, you know what, if you're going to make use of a client's signature, um, the FSA strongly recommends that the financial services providers refrain from the practice of using an electronic signature of a client, even um, with the consent of that client. But what they mean is they say that if the client is going to sign anything electronically, the client must insert the signature. Even if the client gave you a letter to say, you know what, Lilani, it's okay, here's a copy of my electronic signature that you can keep on file and just sign the documents when I telephonically tell you to do it. They say no. Um, you have to let the client sign. They call it wet sign. They have to wet sign. You can do it electronically every time themselves. So, so you forward the document your client from the financial service provider to your client and they put the signature on. You cannot keep the signature on file on their behalf and insert it. And I agree with that because it will give um, rise to some fraudulent claims. Then just very quickly, the Financial Services Conduct Authority's newsletter came out last night, and I'm very excited to share with you just the headings of some of what is in the um, newsletter because we, we, we don't have much time. They talk about the conduct standards for banks and how that has um, elevated the fair treatment of customers. Then they talk, of course, about crypto assets. We've um, chatted about this on your show um, quite a few times and the regulation of that. And then the Ombuds Council. Council. Just something very quick on that. In my meeting with Muvangu, that's the pension funds adjudicator, she said to me, Lilani, we, we part, but we're not really part of the Ombud Council. And I see what she means if I look at the organogram. So just for those who don't know, the Ombud Council is in full swing um, and it's put in place now. And um, Eileen Mayer is actually now the chief, Ombud Council, uh, the chief Ombud for the Ombud Council. I think that's quite a fancy title. You are the chief Ombud, on the Ombud Council. Then on that council, you have a few, Diane Wood, uh, Advocate Dikaleni um, Chabedi, Emmanuel Lekhau, then we have Adam, and then we have um, Adam Harovich and Shemaine Subramani, and then Ka Kathleen, Catherine Gibson is then replaced with Unati, which we know is the new commissioner. So if you look at the pension funds adjudicator and the phase ombud, they do have a reporting line into the ombud council and the chief ombud. But because they statutory ombudsman schemes, they obviously still report into the minister of finance, which makes sense. So the PFA, Muvangu and Advocate Nongku will still report into the phase, uh, into the minister of finance. So that's just very quickly one of those stories. And the last one that I want to share is what is interesting is in this newsletter they say uh, from the FECA that they have face CPD, uh, CBD webinars available for you. So the Financial Services Conduct Authority is currently hosting a series of online face CPD webinars. I've looked at it. It obviously focuses on what is under the ambit, which is um, they do training. I've looked at a few of that on FICA. Um, they are doing training on the board notices and the FACE Act itself, of course. So they've crafted it to share the information that's critical to the integrity of the financial industry. And then very important, they are saying that for CBD purposes, and um, because if you look at the board notice, of course, even the regulator must have their own CBD approved and verifiable for CBD as per that fit and proper board notice. So they are saying um, it is approved for CBD purposes by none other than the Financial Planning Institute. Then just the last thing I want to quickly leave you with, because I see that people are quite opinionated these days around issues of of COVID, the vaccine, and all sorts of other things. Um, 
and that's fine. You're allowed to have your opinion. And I just want to, you know, this this really meant a lot for me. Frederick Douglass, his quote um, from the 1960s. He said, liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. So it just reminded me again of everybody's right, you know, you're entitled to opinion um, and you should not disrespect others if their opinion is maybe slightly different to yours. It's okay, live and let live. And with that note, Francia, again, thank you so much for the opportunity um, and a shout out to everybody online. It's wonderful to just see you again and thank you for your support. Yeah, awesome, Lelani. I was also this morning when I was uh, doing the last prep for this morning show, um, I, I just made a note here to also say thank you um, because, like, there's a lot of effort that goes into, you know, every Friday. <laughs> I laughed after the after the conference. Um, I sent David a message because I wasn't feeling well at the time and I was obviously tired after the conference, so we took a break. I said to him, David, we're not going to have a show on Friday. He goes like, oh, I'm so relieved. <laughs> 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 so I know the, the the work and the effort that goes into this. So just a big thank you. And uh, also yes, for taking hands with us to, to do this. I really appreciate it. Blessings. Awesome. All right. Have a good weekend, Lelani. Stay safe. Uh, please uh, wear three masks because one apparently is not enough anymore. So enjoy. Enjoy your coffee and please stay for the rest of the show. I think it's going to be Indeed, interesting if you have time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so stay. much. Good. Bye. All right. So with that, uh, it is time for some personal development. And uh, today, Norma is going to talk to us about self-doubt. Uh, so excited to get into that as well. So over to Norma. Good morning. Uh, glad to be back today. Um, shoot, there goes my headphones. Sorry. <laughs> I'm talking about self-doubt today. Uh, sorry, let me just get them back. I'm talking about self-doubt today. So I think it's something that really happens to all of us. doesn't matter um, what level of success we've achieved in life. It can happen to the average Joe, it can, or it can happen to a highly successful person. And just the reason is because if we put ourselves out there, if we challenge ourselves, if we put ourselves in new situations, I think it's a, just a natural response to um, putting ourselves in that situation. So we're going to have self-doubt. So self-doubt is when the really per definition, it's a lack of confidence that we have in ourselves or in our ability. But I just want to add to that, that I think that once we put ourselves in a new position um, or in something in a new environment or doing something new, it's we really haven't really mastered that. So um, it, it will be there will definitely be issues of self-doubt, but we need to know that, you know, we're still in the beginning phase. Um, we're progressing. We're, we're getting there. So this being a natural response, um, it's just our brain, again, trying to protect us and it, it gives us this fight or flight, so it gives us, you know, it pumps this adrenaline into our system so that we can react to it. So I just think a healthy dose of, of self-doubt is, is, you know, it's quite good for us because it just indicates that we understand that we need to improve in a certain area just to be better at our job, for instance. So besides the fact that we are human and we have a human brain, um, other factors that contribute to us maybe having self, uh, self doubt is maybe our past experiences or mistakes we've made. It can be from childhood. It can be from comparing ourselves all the time. Um, it might be, like I said, putting ourselves out there and doing something new. It can also be <clears throat> fear of failure we might have or uh, the price that we have to pay um, when we get to success. So just a couple of ways that I think um, that we can maybe think differently about self-doubt um, and that can maybe just free us a little bit of this thing that uh, we call self-doubt and we think is this huge monster sometimes. So the first way is really to embrace self-doubt. So that really anything that we resist will persist. So if we try and avoid it, meaning we're distracting ourselves, or we're trying to totally eliminate it, saying, for instance, that, you know, I'll, I'm just going to be working harder um, so I don't feel the self-doubt, or I think it's, it's, it's um, I'm not going to feel it at that point. Um, instead of doing that, we can really just embrace it. 
So we become aware of it, we acknowledge it, we feel it, and then we can just let it go and then choose an emotion that can really just drive us forward and drive us towards our goals. Another thing is we can really be skeptical of our thoughts sometimes because we have 60,000 thoughts a day and not all of it is going to be helpful. So there's helpful and there's unhelpful thoughts. And we, um, the helpful thoughts is really those that, you know, I have a new business idea or I have to remember that I have a client meeting later. But the unhealthy ones also tend to, to, to pop up every now and then. And those are the ones that says, you know, you're doing it wrong or you should be further along in your career. And those are really the ones we need to question. So we need to know that our thoughts aren't facts. It's merely just sentences that our mind offers us. And once we take that thought and we give it a meaning, then really we just trigger an emotion. So we'd rather trigger um, helpful thoughts or see, see thoughts um, and, and use it to our advantage rather to our disadvantage. Another thing we can do is we see self-doubt as this powerful thing and it um, we sort of overly identify with it. And whatever is in our thoughts, we think it is the truth. So if our thoughts say to us that um, we maybe what we're putting out there is not valuable, we sort of internalize it and think we're not valuable. So just a, a fun way of, of seeing it is to give this self-doubt, give it a name and a personality. So I might think that this is my self-doubt can be this old lady that is very overly critical. And whenever self-doubt comes up for me, I have that image in my mind. And it sort of softens the feeling of that self-doubt. So we can just be curious then and just maybe ask, ask that self-doubt some questions. So maybe, well, how is it trying to serve us? Or what, try, uh, what type of lesson is it um, trying to give us right now? We can also reframe. So if we're in a situation where, let's say we have a difficult conversation with someone and it didn't go as we planned, and we think that this person's going to hate us and be mad at us forever. So instead of saying that, where we're very doubtful in that situation, we can rather say, I'm glad that I had that conversation with that person. It's really going to in the long run, build, um, build our relationships and um, we're going to have better communication, for instance. So just reframing it. Another way um, to free ourselves from self-doubt is really when, when we cultivate a set, you know, set values and we have a strong sense of purpose, then it's much harder for self-doubt to really keep us small. So if I, for instance, have this amazing message that I want to get out into the world, then it's very unlikely that um, self-doubt will keep me small. So I would definitely then get up on that stage and talk to a thousand people just to get my message out, message out there. So it just shows you in this situation that our higher purpose sort of take priority above self-doubt. And then lastly, just to have self-compassion. So... Um, not to shame ourselves for having self-doubt because we already um, lack the confidence um, to top that up with shame about, you know, why we're feeling it. it it's, uh, the, it's wrong for us to feel that way. We can rather approach it as we would approach a friend, which is maybe in that same situation. So having compassion and supporting, supporting that friend and then obviously taking that advice for yourself. So I want to leave you with this. It's just an analogy that I thought, um, you know, could help um, to remind you of exactly what self-doubt, how it can help you. So if I'm in my car and I'm driving and I'm on my way to my goals and my dreams, I'm in the driver's seat and I'm in control. But I have passengers in my car. So I have self-doubt as one of those passengers. So instead of saying... Yeah, so I can do one of two things. So I can allow self-doubt to scream loudly in the background and totally distract me from where I'm going. And eventually I need to pull over and I need to stop my car. And I might procrastinate for the day or for a, uh, a week or for a month or for a year or for a decade. I might not be able to um, pursue my goals. Uh, or I can take the alternative route 
which is I can allow self-doubt to be in the background. I can listen to it and I can give it the necessary attention, but my eyes are focused on my goal and I'm moving forward despite of what self-doubt has to say sort of in the back of the car. So I hope this was helpful for you. Um, thank you for listening and I'll talk to you again next week. Awesome stuff, Norma. Um, it is amazing to sort of see, you know, like I love how you just stay calm when things fall out and they like you are so focused on on the thing and uh, well done. It's uh, it's also amazing for me, like, because we don't, we never coordinate. So whether it's the FBI or whether it's Norma or somebody doing another segment on the show, I never coordinate and communicate my topic to them before the time. Like they, each of them run their own segment, they decide what they want to talk about um, and, and all of that. And it's amazing how what you just spoken about today is going to fit perfectly into what I'm going to talk about now um, about unlocking value in your business, because self doubt is one of those, those killers in business, I, I would say. And the also the other thing that I always appreciate about the things that you share is how you turn it around of like, how can I use it to my advantage? instead of to my detriment so so well oh, done uh, and amazing and also thanks to you like i know like every wednesday like i get <laughs> the layout of what you're going to talk about what the things are and um you know you, you you also put a lot of effort into into preparation and just thank you to you as well i uh, really appreciate that well thank you thanks so much for the feedback that was a good stuff so have a good weekend and we'll catch you next week great thank you thanks to everyone awesome. bye Cheers, Norms. Bye. All right. So uh, before I get into the feature topic, there's a couple of things that uh, I need to, to share with you just very, very quickly. And uh, let me just uh, make sure that everything is fine here on the screens. Um, so, yeah. So the first thing is that uh, on next week, Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., we are hosting our very first awards evening for everybody that completed the speaker and influencer program from South Africa and also that spoke at the Global Financial Planning Conference. So we're going to uh, celebrate that. Uh, it was the first time that we, we were involved in that conference and uh, we really had an amazing first day where the whole first day was just South African speakers and most of them have never ever spoken on a stage or on a screen uh, before. So we really want to celebrate that. We do want to uh, like invite you to come and share this evening with us. Uh, we did send out uh, sorry, an email. I will be sending out a, a, I think there was a WhatsApp as well. We'll be sending out another one as we always do uh, to invite you to this. And uh, it's going to be uh, broadcasted on, on YouTube on the Propulsion Learning Channel. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't schedule it. So you won't be able to find it before the time. But we are going to go live at 10 to 6 on Tuesday evening. So then you'll be able to find it on the channel. There is a link to the channel as well in the WhatsApp and in the email. And uh, please, uh, we want to invite you to attend and come and enjoy and celebrate South African excellence with us. And uh, it's, it's really going to be a privilege. Uh, both Rizan and myself will be hosting the evening. And we have, let me just think quickly, uh, and, and everybody <laughs> that went through it. I think there's two people that have not, that are not able to make it, uh, that went through this program uh, and that, that spoke at the conference. But then also we are going to have live Dominic Galenzo and Nick Alston will also be joining us live. So really excited about that. And uh, so don't miss this evening. It's going to be very valuable because we're not only doing awards, there's also some interesting insights and things we're going to share and some tips and tricks we want to give that you can also benefit from. So please come and join us for that. Then our next CPD live event uh, will probably be, it was supposed to be next week, uh, but it's just been crazy. So it'll probably be the week after that, uh, but we will be sending out uh, the information for that. It'll be on uh, the tech versus the human. Uh, that's what it's going to be about. Um, so, so look out for that. And then on Monday, our, our second part of the LinkedIn 10 day challenge is starting. Uh, you didn't have to do the first part. Uh, you could just uh, sign up for, for the second part. Propulsion Pro members, uh, just, they just participate. Uh, there's no cost for Propulsion Pro members. So uh, if you want to get into this challenge and many others, uh, then please consider joining Propulsion Pro. All the information at the link below. So uh, it'll be great to have you become part of this amazing community. Uh, so please look out for that. Uh, but yeah, on Monday, the 10-day LinkedIn challenge is starting and we're focusing on strategy, engagement and growing your network, building your brand. And in 10 days, we break it down. At the end of that, you're going to have a very practical, implementable strategy uh, to take forward on, on LinkedIn. So with that mouthful, <laughs> let me uh, head on over then to the feature topic, which is this morning, unlocking your practices through value.
right? Amazing stuff. Right, so let's get into this because there's quite a mouthful and a lot of information that I do want to share with you. And as I said, there's also going to be a book recommendation at the end. Uh, I just couldn't put this book down once I started. It really like opened my mind and it actually literally removed the glass ceiling that I've been bumping my head against now for the last couple of years. And uh, it, it really changed my mindset. So there's a few things that I do want to share with you uh, around this and the amazing things that's possible actually in your business. But like I always do, it's like I need to set the scene and I want to ask you some questions that you need to consider. So if you have something to write with um, or, or that, or obviously you can come back and watch the recording of this as well. And if you are watching the recording, welcome. Awesome to, to have you here. Um, so the first thing that I want to ask is like, why did you start your business? Now, let me just clarify when I say when you started your business. So you may be an independent financial advisor. You're the only advisor in your business. Maybe you have staff, maybe you don't have staff, doesn't matter. Maybe you work for a, a, an FSP. In other words, you're an employee of an FSP, but you still work on fees and commissions and, and your income is, is based on what you do and how you do it. And again, you can have the same setup within that FSP for your practice. So that's sort of the distinction I always make between when I talk about a business, you are the owner of the FSP, be it only yourself or whether you have multiple advisors. And then the practice is just, Maybe it's, it's when you work for an FSP, so you're not the owner of the FSP, be it a product provider or an independent FSP or a bank, doesn't matter. You, you, you have your practice within that, but you run it like your own business. So, so that's the distinction between a, when I talk about business and practice, and I also like a normal guy from the Free State does, is I talk about those two things interchangeably as if they are the same thing, because I think the mindset, the approach and all of that should be uh, exactly the same. So my question again is like, why did you start your business or why did you start your, your practice? Why did, you, why did you go into this line of business, um, into this industry, into this profession? Like what made you do that? And what is the main aim? What are you trying to, to, to achieve? Is it just so that you can have a certain lifestyle and that is sort of the focus that obviously because your business and your practice will enable a certain kind of lifestyle, and if you're after a certain lifestyle, this is probably uh, the, the place where you can achieve that. But is that the reason? So once you've achieved living or creating or designing that specific lifestyle, is that enough? Is that all you wanted? You want kind of a lifestyle business? Maybe, um, you know, you, you're very focused on, on balance of life, for example, which we all should be. And uh, as soon as you've achieved that, then, then that's sort of enough. Uh, there, there, there's no bigger picture there. It's not a part of your retirement plan. So, or, or, or is it? So, so is your business or your practice, is, that part of, is it a big part of your retirement plan? You know, often like we see in, in reality and in, in real life and in practice that most entrepreneurs don't make provision for retirement in a specific way because they see their business as their retirement plan which is a very high risk and and which can pay off or it can't but are you clear on on what the reason is for your business is that one of the things is this part of your retirement plan and and you know it doesn't really matter whether you want to exit the business completely or whether you just want to maybe focus on just a handful of clients you know i don't want to want to go that route you know, or is the, is the purpose of this business that when you started it, you had a very clear vision and you said, well, I want to build this business to a certain value and then I want to exit the business. So whether I'm 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, I want to exit this business. I want to sell it to someone else. I want to get the money and then, I don't know, go buy an island or something. So is that maybe the purpose of the business? Was that your plan when you started? Or did you start this business to work until you drop? So you will die in your chair like in front of your computer, behind the desk, is that what you're going to do? And that's all of that stuff is fine. But my, my reason for asking this question is, are you clear on why you started your business in the first place? And then I, th I guess the second part to that is, did the reason maybe change over time without you even realizing it? Because our values change over time. Things that are important to us in different phases of our lives changes the way we think about things, the way we value things, the way we prioritize. So is, has this happened in your business maybe, you know, um, and even and all these things that I'm also sharing, I just want to note, like, although I'm focusing on financial planning businesses, um, this applies to any kind of business as well, uh, I would say. The next big question is, what is the purpose? So that was your why, that the sort of why did you start this? And sometimes, like maybe something I could add there was that we, you started this business out of necessity, because that's definitely a big drive as well. 
but what is the purpose of your business? And I did talk a little bit last week about, you know, what is the, what does a great business look like? Like, like what is, what is the purpose of a great business? And, and sort of three of the things that sort of stood out for me is that, well, one, we want to serve, but we must also be clear that when you're building a great business, a business where you want to leave a legacy is that you're not only serving clients, you're also serving employees. You are enabling lifestyles for other people that work for you and for your clients. So this is a massive responsibility and also an amazing sort of thing to do and, and an amazing position to be in to be able to do that. So whether it's for one employee or a thousand employees, that that is actually irrelevant. But when you enable a life for someone else and it impacts their family in a positive way, like do we do we get how important and how amazing that opportunity is to be able to to do that but obviously you start a business to make a profit because that is what business is about it's not a charity it is business and we are there to make a profit and then we're there to grow because if you don't grow inflation is anyway going to erode everything that you've built so you have to grow like there is no choice if we stay stagnant like something's going to catch up with us so we have to focus on on growing the business but then I thought about it a little bit further and said, okay, so well, really, what is the purpose of business? So the big thing is that it, like, if I have a business and I think back to a conversation that I had with a financial advisor way back, I think it was about 20, it was, it was yeah, about 20, 2008, 2009, around about there. We had this, this conversation around like, you know, how does the business link to the personal side? Uh, so uh, how is the, what is the link between the business and the business owner? And what is it like, where do you start? Do you start with a person? Do you start with a business? And that sort of got me to realize that the business is the thing that enable everything else in your personal capacity. So it's really about enabling and fulfilling your dreams and your aspirations of which part is your lifestyle, but there are bigger dreams bigger things that we want to achieve. And that's, that's very important to us as well. And that is one of the main things that a great business will do. It will enable that for you. And then I think most importantly is either, you know, doing something significant or leaving a legacy or both. Um, and that is what a, what a great business can do. Um, and that's why I said, you know what, like if you, if we serve employees, we serve clients and we make a tangible difference in their lives, regardless of the type of business you're in or regardless what part of the financial planning profession you focus on, it is something that we really need to consider and to say, well, if that is what I want to do, maybe you're not, not leaving a legacy at the moment. Maybe you're not having that impact. Maybe you're not enabling your, your dreams and your aspirations. Maybe you're not enabling the, the dreams and aspirations of your employees and your clients but you can. So what is the plan? Um, that, that is sort of the, the big question there. My next question is, uh, what is important for you in business? Um, and, and, and maybe most important to you, uh, you know, like a lot of, at, specifically if it's a smaller business, and, and I've had this mindset now for a very long time, where I just, you know, it's about maximizing profits for me in my personal capacity. In other words, I want to pay as little tax as possible. I want to keep my expenses as low as possible. And I'm not leaving any money in my business. Uh, because if I do, uh, I need to pay tax on dividends and things like that when I do want to get money out. So, uh, you know, and, and often if you look at your effective rate, it's much better. And we've spoken about this in our business assurance uh, programs and the um, refreshers and things like that that you look at an effective tax rate of 42.4%, uh, 42 I think, is the, is the effective tax rate. Like if you left money in your business and you, you left the profit in your business versus pulling it out as a salary and then paying less tax because like we pay, pay, pay tax on a tiered basis in our personal capacity. So it would make sense. Again, it's one of those big lessons where you look at the theory, you look at the uh, sort of what the, um, the academic things are that we learn about tax and that and then you think about how do i apply it in practice well let's apply it like that and it seems to work because i do pay less tax because i take uh, more of a salary out of the business uh, than than rather leaving it there and then having to pay tax and then later on if i want the money i need to pay a further 20 percent on the amount that i'm taking out as dividends so i that's maybe one of the things that's most important to you is just, I just want to minimize tax. I want to get as much out of this as possible for my own personal benefit. Are you hoarding cash in your business? 
is that the other thing so that's almost the opposite so you don't take anything out of your business you just let it, you just leave it there and you don't touch it um, so you don't do anything you're just hoarding cash so you've got this nice bank balance in your business but you're not employing that money to grow your business and 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 to enable all the things that we spoke about earlier so maybe that's another thing that that's important to you then continuously searching for new opportunities and untapped markets you know maybe that's most important to you so you're forever looking for where's the next opportunity where's the next client you know how can i grow my business how can i expand and all the only thing that you focus on is growing the business so growing the client base growing the income growing the revenue but that is that is the sole focus uh, maybe that is that is most important or maybe specifically if you've been around for for, for quite a while um, you may have reached a certain point where you have now realized that lifestyle you've now come to that point where you know what i put in a lot of sweat blood and tears so now all i'm going to do now is maintain and retain that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to grow anymore. I just want to keep what I have. I just want, want to, to, to simplify my life. And that's all I want to do. Or maybe the focus is to continuously grow the business through client acquisition. So the main aim is just new clients, new clients, new clients. We forget about the existing clients. And it's all about like how many appointments do I have? How many new clients did we onboard? It's all about new client growth in your business. On the flip side as well, you could have, um, you know, that's continuous growth, but you can also have exponential growth through looking for acquiring other FSPs. So maybe uh, offering people succession programs, succession plans, and you bring financial advisors with the existing books into your business and you grow exponentially in that way. Is the, is the, is the sort of going back to the paying as little tax as possible um, and maximize what I take out of the business is maximizing personal cash flow. Uh, maybe that's the, 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 the sort of focus. Um, or on the other hand, you know, are you dead set on maximizing business value? So, yeah, there's, that's a mouthful. I think there's a lot of questions there and I'm, I'm running through them uh, maybe quite quickly, but definitely something that needs to be uh, considered. Like what is important for you in business? Apart from, I'm not talking about ethics and, you know, doing the right thing and helping the client and focus. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about building your business like what is most important for you in your business so so this is not really about how you do your business this is the what what is important to you and possibly linking why this is important to you would, would be the next step but that's definitely something that uh, needs to be uh, sort of considered then um there's a few mistakes and 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 i've made plenty of these mistakes so I thought before I share how we can maximize the value of our businesses, let me maybe share, you know, mistakes that destroy value. Um, you know, because specifically if you're looking at selling your business or maybe you want to bring in partners or maybe you want to raise capital because we're all building different types of businesses. And that's the one thing that we need to be clear on is like, what type of business do you want to build? It's not so much about how much money do you want to make and how much, you know, like how big do you want to go? This is just like, what type of business do you want to build? Is it just a small business or do you really want to build this into a national business or even a cross border business where you have several financial advisors that advise clients, help clients, serve clients, uh, no matter where they are in the world. So, so that's as big as you can, as you can go. Uh, but that's up to you and there's no like preferred way it is what works for you it, it's what fits with your personality it's what fits with how much stress you can handle um, so there's a lot of, of of that that we need to consider excuse me so um which things really destroy business value and and this is so important for me and and maybe you'll you'll be surprised and maybe you won't be about where does this start and I just realized that it starts with an inappropriate mindset. If your mindset isn't right, if it's, and this is where the self doubt and all those things sort of link in that Norma was talking about is if your mindset isn't right, if you're not, if there's no vision, if there's no plan. Um, so those three things go together. You need the right mindset. You need a vision. You need a plan. Uh, if you don't have that, then you will just stay where you are. Uh, and if that's what you want, that's okay. But if that is not what you want and you've, you've been wondering, why am I not growing? Why am I really battling to break through to the next level? It's possibly, if, we, if you really sit and analyze it deeply, that it starts with our mindsets. It's having an inappropriate mindset. 
So you want to do something, but in the back of your mind, you're telling yourself like, oh, I can't do that. I won't be able to achieve this. This is impossible. I'm sitting in a small town. I'm, I'm you know, there's too much competition in the city. There's like all these reasons that sort of fuels the self-doubt and fear that, uh, you know, you, 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 you won't be able to reach it. And maybe one of the other things you're thinking in the back of your mind is that, but what if I do make it? What if I lose everything? Then what? You know, what happens then? Like, will I be able to do it again? Do I even know how I got here? Do I even know, like, how did I, why was I able to achieve this in the first place? Can I replicate it? And those are all the things that then just goes in this mala miela, like, you know, over and over and over. The other thing uh, that destroys value is minimizing profit, and which is something that I've now done for the last couple of years is take out, like, I leave a very small amount of profit in my company. The rest of it I would pay out as a salary and uh, pay the tax on that and it was fine because my business is not that big um, it makes sense that i would do that and then you know it's about maximizing sort of after tax profits and that is one way to do it but that is not the right way i realized um to to actually build a business with value and build a business with purpose you need money in that business you need to keep the profit there and uh, it's, it's really important but i'll get you how to maximize the value of your business in a second the other thing is lack of systems and processes. And this one is not new. I'm pretty sure that you've heard this like several times from several different people, uh, any kind of business strategy book, or, or like if you look at how do you create value in your business, this will be there. You need systems and you need processes and you need people to be able to run this. Um, and the main reason for this is that at some point, we need to start removing ourselves from the business if we really want to up the value from this. As soon as you and I are the reason why the business makes money, it becomes a problem in <clears> the <throat> long term. Unless that is all you want. So you're not, you don't care about selling the business. You don't care about getting anything out at the end. You're making provision for retirement in another way. So in that case, it wouldn't matter to you. But if, if, if your business is a big part of your, your retirement plan, for example, um, and for leaving a legacy and making sure that this thing continues way beyond your life, then it is extremely important that that we consider that then having the business depend on you as i just said um you know if you and i are the central point the reason the business exists the reason the business makes money like if you and i are not there the business is not making money then long term it's not going to create value in your business it will be able to generate an income to enable your lifestyle but you won't be building something of significant value and then the other thing is obviously if you have a business with volatile cash flow so there's no you can't predict the cash flow it's up and down up and down up and down and then there's money and then for months there's no money and then there's money and then there's no money and you need to do it like that but you there's no trend you don't know sometimes there's not there's no money coming in for a month sometimes there's not money coming in for six months you know sometimes there's a lot of money coming in in january sometimes there's not so volatile cash flow is something that really really kills any kind of business's value because it's unpredictable so if you think about all these things, um, you know, together, the inappropriate mindset, no vision, no plan, uh, you know, purposefully minimizing your profit, lack of systems and processes, having the business depend on you, and then having volatile cash flow in the business. I mean, you can see why this is such a big risk for anybody who would maybe want to invest in your business, who would want to acquire your business. And, and this is why these things still apply to whether you are working for an FSP and they have some form of an agreement to take over your book when you pass away or you retire or do anything like that, you can maximize that value by having the right things in place because it does make it more, more um, valuable for, for them. All right, then how do I maximize my business's value or how can you maximize your business's value? Well, obviously then, <clears throat> if those are the things that destroy value, we need to, to sort of use it in another way. So the first step is to decide on the mindset because mindset is a decision. A mindset is something that you can focus on. It's not going to be, okay, I make a decision so my mindset is now positive or better or focused on growth or seeing the opportunity. You will still default to the mindset that you have had for such a long time. But if you are aware that you want to have a different mindset, you can stop yourself and say, no, 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 that's not how we think. We think in this way now. And that's the important part about that. But then once you've decided on the mindset, like what is really possible, like removing that glass ceiling, as I just shared with you what I've done um, recently. And it's really amazing, like suddenly you are thinking in a totally different, on a, on a total different level. You're seeing things that you never saw before. It, it's really an amazing place to, to, to be. 
But then what you need to do is to sort of say, well, what do I want to achieve long term? And what I did uh, specifically is to say, listen, so this is my retirement plan, right? Um, <clears throat> because for years I've been building this business and doing the things that destroy value instead of creating value. So I haven't built up much value in, in, in my business as such at this point in time. But what is my long term vision? Like, where do I want to get to? And, and I, I'll take you through the process. What I simply did is say, well, 10 years from now, and you can do five years, 10 years, 50 years, doesn't the, the, the term is actually irrelevant. But 10 years from now, I will be 56. All right. So I said, well, so if if I have hypothetically wanted to retire at age 56, you know, what do I think I would need? And then what would I need to be able to sustain that just to say until a certain age? So I've actually taken some financial planning principles and employed it here and said, well, that's how much money I need. And then I said, OK, so if I want to realize that value from selling my business, all right, so, so there's obviously two ways. I can sell the business or I can build up value and income from that business to sort of fund that and remove myself from the business so that other people run it, but I, I can still fund my retirement. So, but just to say that I want to sell the business and I want to exit the business. So I then said, well, that's the money that I need. And then I started working back. So, okay, so if that's the value, you know, if that's what I need to realize, and let's just say I started the business from zero, what would the capital gains tax be? Sort of worked that out. Um, so we adjusted the figure and then sort of you work it back from there if you use some of the business valuation methods to say, well, if the, I want to realize that kind of value, what does my bottom line need to look like? So what does my, my profit after tax need to look like uh, for that to happen? And that's sort of how I now got a plan of where I need to be in 10 years time. And all I'm doing now, I'm busy going through the process, is saying, well, so what did I do in year nine, year eight, year seven, year six, year five, year four? And what, what am I doing right now? So I'm working backwards from where I've already done that. And that's one of the mindsets. I've already achieved it. So whether you want to buy another property, you want to sell your business, you want to buy a car, you want to, whatever. I've done this, okay? And this is what it cost me. And this is what, I, what I'm doing. Like, how did I get here? How did I, how was that possible? You will be amazed at how easy it is to work backwards from there and say, well, get to, so what do I, what's the first step that I need to do? The problem is we often rather focus on the first step and then we don't know what the what the other steps are going to be. So how do I get to to step two? And what is step three? And what is step four? And what is step five? I don't know because I'm I'm, I'm still here. I can't even see there. But if I start ten and I'm walking backwards, you remember that that thing about like you know hindsight is twenty twenty vision. So it's easier to look back from from there and say, well, what did I do? And it's not to say that we'll get it. Uh, like spot on and 100% correct, but you're going to have a very clear plan of how to get there. So, uh, so that's sort of that that first step that that you need to do. Um, then there's three hats that you need to wear, and this is a massive. Like I had this discussion with Vessel Westhuizen uh, a few weeks ago, and that sort of blew my mind. And then the book recommendation that I'm going to give you, this guy was also speaking about exactly the same thing. But it's wearing the three hats. And for me, there's three hats. There's an employee hat. So this is where you do the job of financial advisor, financial planner, financial coach, whatever it is that, 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 that you offer. But it's doing the job, uh, rendering the services, selling the products. Whatever it is that you're doing in your business to generate income, it's that. Okay. Then the second hat would be that of the CEO. So the CEO is on a totally different level uh, than the um than, than the employee, obviously, and they can, because they, they're sort of sitting higher in the hierarchy, hopefully, they can see more of the business, they can sort of see what's coming, uh, they're not in the trenches, so you have to take off the employee hat and put on the CEO hat and say, well, you know, what needs to happen, what is the strategy, how do we realize what we want to do? But the hat where you actually need to start is the hat of the shareholder, and that's the thing when we have a small business that we never really do, you don't think about it from a shareholder perspective. If, if you did not work in this business, you were not the CEO of the business, all you did was investing in this business, what would you want? How would you want this business to grow? What markets do you want it to, 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 to access? Where do you want this thing to go? Because the CEO will take that and then create a strategy and then get that down to the employees and the management of the business in order to implement and make it a reality. So we have to take off, doesn't matter if you're a one man, one woman business, or whether you're a multinational business, you need to think and put on these hats, uh, because it changes the way that we look at things. And unless we change the way we look at things, 
things are not going to change. Then also the other big thing, obviously, is focusing on creating predictable revenue. And how do we do that? Well, obviously, with recurring revenue, um, if you think about like many software businesses, uh, they are able to create software as a service. In other words, people, people pay monthly to use and access the software. So they have a very stable, very predictable income. Those types of businesses are worth a lot more than somebody who needs to walk out every day and start from zero and see what they can amass uh, from, from, from that perspective. And all of this can be supported by certain agreements, certain things that are in place in order to protect the business, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but definitely focusing on creating predictable revenue and also not just one revenue stream that's predictable, but multiple revenue streams that are predictable. Um, that, is, that is sort of that. And then all the one-offs and, and, and those kind of uh, revenue and income becomes a big bonus, the cherry on top of that, of that business. But the base of the business it has a recurring predictable income. And the other thing that that enables is for you to have time to go and sit and put on the hat of the CEO, put on the hat of the shareholder as well. Because if you, if you need to run off the revenue every single day, uh, you're not going to have time for, for the other two hats. So, so very important to do that. And then the other thing you need to do is maximize profit in your business and minimize the salary that you take out of the business. Um, and with that, I don't say take nothing. Uh, I'm definitely not saying that you need to downgrade your lifestyle. What I am saying is take the least amount of salary and rather take dividends maybe at the end, specifically if you're thinking about bringing on partners into your business. If you're thinking about maybe raising capital for your business, maybe there's those kind of things that you want to do that would then necessitate that you maximize the value. Because if you're selling the business, I mean, the next person will take over your salary. So, so you can just count that back. But when you want to bring people into your business, maybe there are employees or financial advisors in your business that you would ideally want to, to, to give shares to in the business, then you want to maximize the value because otherwise, like if, you, if all the profit is taken out of the business, there's no value. Saying I have shares in a business means absolutely squat unless I can unlock value from that perspective. So that is uh, extremely uh, important and extremely uh, valuable. All right, so before I give you the book, let me quickly run over to the, uh, to the comments and see. Um, so Govendra says, grow or close are the two options in business. Uh, absolutely. So Tracy, good morning, Tracy. Nice to see you. I like what you mentioned there, fulfilling your dreams and aspirations in business. It's a pleasure. Kuba says, I remember 20 years ago, 1 August 2021, major milestone while I found my why, added my purpose, but most critically, uh, could connect both to my passion and then only took perseverance. Yes. Um, Kubis, and, and also I want to, uh, if people can, you know, if, if, if the audience, you are welcome to go and look at the Propulsion podcast. Uh, episode two is when I spoke to Kubis, and this is where he really opened up and he shared a lot of his journey uh, in that discussion as well. So that was a, f a phenomenal uh, discussion that we had. So, so go and check that out as well um, of how, like, what did he went through and, and how did he get to his why and all of that. So Kubis, I don't know if you remember that we shared that, uh, but, but that story is, is available there. Um, Russell says, good points. Good morning, Russell. Uh, build passive income where your money works for you and you do not work for your money. No cash flow concerns at all with no pressure on sales, but all focus on advice. Yes. And, and I think you make a very important point there, Kervis, because like as long as the focus needs to be generating new revenue every day, every week, every month, it does sort of blur that line between you know, what's good for the client, what's good for you. And there's a, there's a period of time that one can really just focus. But as soon as I need to pay my car, I need to pay this, then the focus starts to shift a little bit. It's not to say that now you're not, um, you know, uh, you're not doing things in the best interest of the client, but it does make it significantly harder in order to do that. And, and that's the thing. So the sooner you can get to that predictable revenue, that recurring revenue, that passive income, then the better you and your clients and your business will be. So it's an extremely valuable, valuable thing there. Mr. TT, love the work backwards approach. It is so effective. Absolutely. Awesome topic. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Russell, good book recommendation. I'd, I'd also recommend uh, Sell It Like Sirhant by Ryan Sirhant. Like uh, us, even though he's in real estate, he explains. So 
Let me just also say there, um, I believe that there's lots that we can learn from how people do business in other industries. There's a lot of value in that, um, you know, just listening to how other financial advisors and planners built their business. A lot of value because we understand we speak the same language. But looking at other places, and, and you'll remember maybe me saying in one of the episodes that one of the big things that we need to realize is that what consumers will be demanding in financial services will not come from financial services or the lack of things in financial services. It will come from what they experience in other industries. And they say, but like, why can't my financial advisor do this? Why can't my bank do this? That's where the innovation is going to come from. And that's where the consumer demand is going to come from. It's what people are doing in other industries, not necessarily what they are doing in, 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 in ours. Uh, SaaS is a great way to generate an income stream. Absolutely. Uh, rugby team, uh, Razan, rugby team has their <clears throat> forwards and backs and everyone has a function to optimally play the game. Bringing people in in the areas you lack uh, uh, makes for a stronger team. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Kurva says, I remember vividly. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Also, I remember listening to your first podcast with Andre while in Belize. Nice, nice. Uh, Johan Marie, good morning, Johan. Uh, he says, a very informative. All right, so as promised, the book recommendation is uh, this book. So, the, yeah, it's in Afrikaans, but you also get it in, it, it is available in English as well. Uh, so think like a billionaire or think like a milliardaire, and maybe you think like, oh, I'm so far from that. When I picked up this book, I couldn't put it down for two days, and I read this whole thing in two days. Um, it's practical, simple examples. It is simple things, and he talks to small business owners. It's not only meant for big businesses. And this is where the mindset started to, to, to change for me. So go have a look at this. This is uh, Daniel Strauss. Uh, Daniel is married to Rolene Strauss. I don't know who made who famous. So is it the fact that she married him or he married her? So she was a former Miss World and Miss South Africa. Um, so he's also, well, he's built a, a big business called Stocks and Strauss. Um, so really coming from a practical perspective, experience, he shares his journey. Uh, as I said, like the stories are amazing. It's an easy to read book. Uh, really, really amazing. Uh, the, the font is nice and nice and big if you can see there so it's an easy read it's not like an academic book it's really really an amazing book so go check it out daniel strauss uh think like a billionaire or don't you say milliardaire so pick your language of choice but that's my book recommendation go get it <laughs> really like it's it's an amazing book it'll open your mind to so many things um and on that note yes thank you so much for being with us this morning i really appreciate it thanks to lilani thanks to norma and uh, the FBI uh, for, for all the contributions. I really appreciate it. And we'll be back next week, same time, same place. And uh, please join us for the awards evening on Tuesday evening live at 6 p.m. right here on the YouTube channel. And I uh, look forward to seeing you. So with that, have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe and remember, raise the bar.